Hello, everybody. Uh, we welcome you to once again most warmly to the Overcome Anxiety series by Anxiety Social Net. Uh, we hope that uh, you had a wonderful time with us in the past few. Okay, the team with the, at Anxiety Social Net um, uh, has come up with the Overcome Anxiety series because we thought uh, that we had to bring you um, all the methods of treatment for your anxiety. Uh, we just don't believe in a regular chat around anxiety and uh, other mental health disorders. We uh, truly believe in bringing treatment. Uh, so we are here with you once again today on the third day uh, of the Overcome Anxiety series, episode one. And uh, we have with us Mr. Kevin Patton. Hello. So Mr. And I also have with me Mr. Salomon Tasovich. He's the founder of ASN. Hi there. And we will be uh, bring. We will be talking about corporal therapy today. Uh, we have had a lot of questions about this particular form of therapy uh, on our social network, that is Anxiety Social Net, and we hope that you have a very good. Uh, so, Kevin, it is over to you. Uh, hi, I'm Kevin. I'm a therapist in private practice here in Hackney. And tonight we're going to talk about how to reduce the impact of our anxiety symptoms and bring some balance back into our lives. We're going to start with a presentation and then we'll take some questions and answers. Uh, okay, so while Kevin is uh, going to share his screen, I have to tell you uh, that uh, we have been talking with him for quite a while and I must say uh, we found him to be a very, very good therapist. He's located in Hackney, London. He also has his private practice <clears throat> and we are going to share all these details with you. And just before we start, uh, I would like all of you to do some housekeeping. Uh, if you have any questions for us, you can post it as comments uh, in this video or you can go to our Facebook page where the post for this particular video has been pinned to the top. So you will find it right at the top and you can post your comments, uh, questions there as well as comments. Uh, we hope uh, that this is very helpful to you. So Kevin, let's begin. Okay, now anxiety is a warning signal that something requires our attention. Our nervous system responds by releasing a flood of stress chemicals including adrenaline and cortisol. This rouses the body to, for emergency action such as fight or flight. Now this happens whether there's really something out there that requires our immediate attention or we just think that there's some kind of emergency when there actually is none. And that's the trouble. Our survival instincts don't really care. It's better to be safe than sorry so the initial alert is enough to trigger the arousal state that sets us up for action and shutting down our uh, higher faculties. Now, nobody in their right mind would run into a burning building to save a kitten or charge down a machine gun nest armed only with a bayonet. But when our adrenaline is up, we'll do all of that and more, setting ourselves up for a whole world of hurt. So, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And CBT uses the five aspects model to look at how we make, tie ourselves up in knots and make ourselves miserable. It starts out when we become aware that something's going on that needs our attention. We have thoughts that will either overestimate or exaggerate the actual threat or underestimate or minimize our ability to cope. Our body's automatic survival mechanism kicks in very quickly and this helps energize us to fight or run away. We'll notice all sorts of physical sensations going on and these can be quite unpleasant and sometimes very scary which will make us do things that will make ourselves feel better, such as avoiding people or places or getting involved in um, what we call safety behaviors, such as self-talk, drink, holding a drink, smoking more, fiddling with your clothes, fiddling with your hair, avoiding eye contact, having some sort of escape plan so you can bail early, or sometimes using drugs just to help you get through. These safety mechanisms, these safety behaviors, can help actually make our anxiety worse. It keeps the whole thing going. While we depend on them to help us cope, we don't find out that without them, the anxiety would reduce and go away all on its own. We'll talk about this later. This is something called neuronal plasticity. Now, while avoiding people in situations might help us feel better at the time, it doesn't make our anxiety any better over the longer term. If we're frightened that our anxiety will make us pass out or vomit when we go to the supermarket, we won't find out that it won't actually happen because we don't go there. So the belief that it will happen remains and 
the anxiety continues. Now, we all feel anxious sometimes. A certain amount of anxiety helps us feel more alert and focused. For example, just prior to an exam, a few exam there have a positive effect. They motivate us, they help us focus our thoughts on the job at hand, they make us more alert. Too much anxiety or constantly being anxious is unhealthy and this can seriously mess with our lives and relationships. Now CBT is an approach that helps us develop a set of cognitive and behavioral tools to reduce the negative emotions, distress, associated with and driving our symptoms. It's an empirical method in which the, the client and the therapist draw upon the evidence base trying, to, trying out various strategies to find out which is the best fit for the client's situation and lifestyle. This means homework. By agreeing to work with the therapist, the client undertakes to practice whatever technique they agree upon between sessions and report back to about whether they found that helpful. Then working in partnership, the client and the therapist negotiate a treatment plan, adapting and honing it to get the best results. Now, from a purely theoretical point of view, it doesn't matter whether we break the cycle by addressing our thoughts or by adopting different behaviours. Both of these affect our emotions. In real life, however, chemicals released during the anxiety response set us up for action rather than thought. And trying to use cognitive tools when we're in a highly charged emotional state is, well, frankly, just asking for trouble. Remember when I said that our nervous system releases adrenaline and cortisol in a response to an emergency situation and how these chemicals make it harder for us to think clearly? Well, the behavioral strategies most commonly used to address anxiety symptoms are specifically designed to neutralize adrenaline and offset its effects on our heart and, more importantly, our brain by stimulating the release of endorphins. In effect, the behavioral strategies bias the headspace to do the critical thinking that in the end is going to help us resolve the problem. Now, the first behavioral strategy we're going to look at is diaphragmatic breathing. When adrenaline is released, it remains active for about 90 minutes. And although we might want to be rational, it's setting us up to be more impulsive. I used to work in a bar and I've lost count of how many times a customer would do the right thing and walk away from a heated argument only to come back some 10 minutes later more fired up than when they left. Until the adrenaline's worn off, we'll be on a short fuse and the next thing, next little thing that happens that's a bit difficult or inconvenient sets us off again. Like I said, adrenaline will remain active in our system for about 90 minutes or until it's, really, until it's neutralized by the release of endorphins. Now, endorphins are the na body's natural painkillers and they're released when we put our muscles under stress. So heavy cardiovascular exercise, circuit training, etc., that would definitely get our endorphins going, but that's not particularly useful in most of the situations we find ourselves in. Now, the diaphragm's a muscle, and it's, not, it's one that we don't work that hard, so it doesn't take much to put it under stress. So we're going to focus on diaphragmatic breathing, also called yogic breathing or pranayama. This is particularly effective as it actually works on two levels. It oxygenates the blood, slowing the heart, and after a few minutes stimulates the release of endorphins, neutralizing the adrenaline. So it's good that it's so good that in 20 minutes pranayama is just as effective as two hours of gym work for getting your endorphins going. It doesn't build you up or anything. It, it's, um, you know, for that you're going to need a bodybuilder, not a therapist. Right, so here we go. We're actually going to do a live um, pranayama exercise. Are you sitting comfortably? Right, now close your eyes. Feel yourself begin to relax. Spend a few moments appreciating yourself, your seat, the world around you. Now bring your attention to your breath. Where do you feel the breath? Follow the movement from where it enters at the tip of your nose all the way down to your belly. And see where attention is most keen. Feel the breath entering and leaving. What sensations do you have? Does it feel hot? Does it feel cool? Is it short and quick? Is there a pause between the breaths, between the intake and the outtake? Just watch your breath. Observe its natural movement. Be aware that you're breathing. 
closely observe every detail of your breath from the place where your attention rests. The tip of your nose, your chest, your belly. Watch one complete breath entering and filling and leaving and emptying. Right. Now I want you to extend the out breath. Empty your lungs until you think that you can't go any further. Most of the time, about 75% of the oxygen we breathe in is breathed right out again because our lungs are full of stale air. This technique helps get the oxygen to where it needs to be, into your lungs, into your blood and ultimately up to your brain. Now breathe in normally, nothing special, just a normal in-breath. Do this a couple more times. Interestingly, it's the out-breath that relaxes. We tense when we breathe in and we relax when we breathe out. Now, generally, I work with clients and I get them to do this for 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes just before they go to bed at night. You practice these exercises when you don't need them so that they're trained in and ready to use when you do need them. Right, now, blood flows more slowly through a tense muscle than it does through a relaxed one. So by relaxing our muscles, we allow our blood to circulate more easily and our heart doesn't have to pump so hard. So now we're going to try a progressive muscle relaxation exercise. Same as before, make yourself comfortable. Begin by tensing all the muscles around your face. Make a tight grimace, close your eyes tightly as possible, clench your teeth, get your jaw really tense, even tense your ears if you can. Hold this for a count of five as you breathe in. Now breathe out, <sighs> relax completely for a count of ten. Let your face go lax as though you were sleeping. Loosen your jaw, feel, feel the tension seep from your face muscles, enjoy that feeling. Okay, next, tense your neck, your shoulders, bring your shoulders up to your ears, tense everything up, tense your face again, count for five, then exhale and relax for a count of ten. Again, relaxing everything down. You continue this down your body, repeating the procedure for the four main muscle groups. So we're looking at the face, the neck, the shoulders and the arms, the abdomen and chest, the buttocks, the legs, and the feet. Quickly focusing on each group, one after the other, with practice you can relax your body like liquid relaxation poured over you. that flows down and completely covers you. Again, I generally recommend that my clients practice this first thing in the morning and last thing at night. After about four weeks, you'll have trained this, you'll have trained this technique in and you'll be able to use it anytime you want. I'm going to look at some cognitive strategies now. Negative automatic thoughts, NATS, also called hot thoughts, are negative thoughts that fuel our anxiety response. Now all NATS have two things in common, they're extreme and they're inflexible. In short, they're irrational. And NATS fall into three basic categories. Beliefs about yourself, for example, I must do well or I'm no good. Beliefs about other people, other people must treat me nicely and kindly and just the way I want or else they're no good and beliefs about the world in general. For example, the world must make it easy for me to get on and must create circumstances that always go my way or else it's a lousy rotten world and it's no good. These three beliefs create the three main emotions commonly experienced by people who seek help. Anxiety, anger and depression. They also create demandingness, whining, condemnation and a damnation of ourselves and an exaggeration of beyond, way beyond the bounds of reality. Now, so common nats include all or nothing thinking, personalizing, it's all about me, those girls laughing at the bus stop, they're laughing at me, catastrophizing, this is terrible, I can't stand it, it's got to stop, emotional reasoning, I feel bad, therefore it must be bad, should or must demands, dogmatizing, we also call this masturbation, I must do this or else and usually there'll be a catastrophe or some label waiting in the background. 
mental filter, we discount the positive things that are going on. Overgeneralization, it's always going to be like this. This is just, this is the way life is. Labeling, I'm bad, she's terrible, this is a disaster. Mind reading, you know, when you think you know exactly what's going on in the other person's mind and you know what they were really saying, what they were really thinking when they were talking to you. The last one, fortune telling, like I'm going to be rubbish at this presentation. Okay, so how do we deal with that? Well, we SWAT them. SWAT stands for Socratic questioning, W questions, attention to what's happening, and thinking critically. Now, just a quick thing on Socratic questions. The purpose of it is to challenge the accuracy and completeness of our thinking in a way that acts to move us towards our ultimate goal. Now, there, there are six basic Socratic questioning techniques. Clarifying concepts, probing assumptions, probing rationale, probing and evidence, questioning viewpoints and perspectives, probing implications and consequences, and questioning the question. As well as the Socratic questioning, we've got the W words. So the, the who, what, when, where, why, how. These are particularly useful in exploring a topic or to probing a specific point. So, you know, like, what do I mean when I say I'm responsible for everything that happens? Another cognitive tool is to pay attention to what's happening. Describe what's actually happening without using evaluations or emotional language. Just what are you responding to? If someone else were to come in and look, what would they be seeing? How would they describe that situation? Ultimately, this is all about thinking critically. Are these thoughts helping or hurting? Is this thought consistent with what you know about the world and reality? And if it isn't, what would be? Is this thought logical? Now, you can see why we start with the behavioral strategies. Trying to do this stuff when we're in a highly charged state is a bit like running a race with your feet tied together. What we're looking at here is the stop technique. This is an effective combination of cognitive and behavioral strategies which with practice you can use when things start to get difficult. So you stop, don't react automatically. Take five breaths, oxygenate your blood, slow your heart. Observe, what am I reacting to here? What's pushing my buttons? How am I driving myself up the wall? Gain some perspective. Is this really an emergency? Or am I just making myself miserable with my thoughts here? Then practice what works. What do I want to happen? And what's the most effective thing I can do to, to get there? Now that we've got the basic tools to manage our symptoms, it's time to look at building up our resilience so that we won't be so affected the next time something difficult happens. We can affect, but we can't control what happens to us in life. We can, however, reduce the distress we experience when things don't go the way we would like them to. There's a negative correlation between our level of serotonin, released when we experience pleasure, and the level of cortisol, released when we're stressed. As our serotonin level increases, our cortisol level goes down. Now, okay, serotonin is a neurotransmitter. It's responsible for, the reward, for rewarding behavior, reinforcing behavior, and balancing moods. I'm talking about basic self-care here. It's important to note that relying exclusively on one particular strategy or, or using it too long results in our chemical receptors becoming desensitized, setting up a cycle of diminishing returns that reinforces the thought that nothing works and increases our feelings of helplessness. Right, so let's talk about B A L A N C E balance. That stands for bodily sensations, achievement, laughter, acceptance, nutrition, connectedness, and exercise. We're going to look at each of these in turn and see how we can use them to help balance out our moods. Right, now serotonin is released in response to novelty. There's something new and good happening. Oh, maybe we should pay attention. Changing up some of the information from our senses and 
will give us a little bit more of a hit of serotonin. So changing up you know, some of the flavors that you taste, different herbs, different spices, use dark chocolate, for example, changing up what you smell, you know, using some scented oils or cut grass, wood shavings, you know, look, changing what you see, looking out sunsets, different hills, watching, you know, these wonderful demonstrations live on, live on coming into your bedroom. Change up what you listen to. You know, listen to different kinds of music, your favourite music, or or even something just new. Maybe Mozart's clarinetto concerto in A major. Or Touch. T you know, different 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 textures, different sensations. You know, petals, warm sand, smooth skin. Using these sensual pleasures, you're you're, you're activating your serotonin and bringing down your cortisol. Okay, we're going to talk about achievement. When we're anxious, we, we often find it hard to decide what we're going to do each day and we end up doing very little. So, you know, it's a good idea to make a list of what you want to do, then plan it out. Start off with the easiest task at first and don't aim too high. For example, walk for 15 minutes rather than try and run a marathon. Or wash the dishes rather than try and spring clean the whole house. Don't set yourself up to fail. You can build your activities up over time work through your action list and tick off what you've done and then at the end of the day look back on what you've achieved what went well and what could you do better the next time this gives you a second bite of the cherry now my favorite laughter um, I'm also a laughter yoga therapist uh, and we, we, we use laughter a lot uh, to help us feel better Science is full of telling us why laughter is good for us. We don't hear so much about the benefits of having a good cry. Now, emotional tears contain leucin, enkephalin, which is associated with pain, and prolactin, which we, we associate with, with stress. Crying has been seen as a good way of, of getting rid of these chemicals, flushing them from our body. Now, laughter increases the levels of immunoglobin in the blood, and after only a few moments, moments laughter, the levels of life-threatening sediments in the blood are reduced. Laughter also appears to intercept the signals between the hypothalamus, which would be concerned with emotion, and the frontal cortex, which is concerned with planning and decision-making. Have you ever noticed that when you're sobbing your heart out, you're not thinking, you can't think? Or when you're laughing your guts out, when you're really doubled over in laughter, you're not thinking. It's breaking down that connection. Now, Earlier I talked about neuronal plasticity. Now it's just one of these things that a neuron will fire for 20 minutes unless you keep feeding it. If you, if you don't, then it gradually dies down, it stops. Now this is back to when we were cavemen. If something wasn't going to kill you in 20 minutes, it wasn't going to kill you, so you don't need to pay that much attention to it. The next thing in the balance um, technique is called acceptance. Uh, it's, it's recognizing that negative feelings are normal. We all feel them. We, we all continue to feel them at all times. Start by practicing the willingness to accept negative feelings. Notice when you feel the body's normal responses to unhelpful thoughts. Don't struggle or fight with them. Just let them be and they'll pass. Now, nutrition. What, what can I say? Everything we put in our body directly has an impact on how we feel physically and emotionally. It's important to be aware of what we're putting into our bodies and how some foods can actually increase our experience of anxiety, especially if we're sensitive. Some of the anxiety we experience may actually be due to particular stimulants we're consuming or deficiencies in, in specific vitamins and minerals. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. It helps to spend some time thinking about our lifestyle and what we might be doing that could be making our anxiety worse. Stimulants, salts, preservatives, hormones in meat, and sweet refined foods can potentially exasperate our anxiety. Now, stress and anxiety can be aggravated not only by what we eat, but by the way we eat. So, eating too fast or on the run, not chewing your food enough, eating too much to the point where you're feeling stuffed or bloated, 
and drinking too much during a meal. That dilutes the stomach acids and the digestive enzymes. Uh, one cup with a meal is sufficient. Now I was talking to Muhammad earlier and he was saying that this is actually in the Quran. Now these behaviors all put a strain on our stomach and intestines and in their attempt to properly digest and assimilate the food and this increases our stress in two ways. Directly through indigestion, bloating and cramping and indirectly through the malabsorption of essential nutrients. Okay, there are specific nutrients that can help decrease our anxiety. These include magnesium, right, as you can see it aids with muscle relaxation. Then you've got uh, zinc, which uh, stops the copper levels building too high. Uh, B complex vitamins. Now, these are the spark plugs of our body. They help provide the energy by acting with enzymes to convert major nutrients such as carbohydrates into energy. They're important for the normal function of the nervous system and are helpful in bringing relaxation and energy to individuals who are stressed or fatigued. A deficiency in certain B vitamins will cause fatigue, irritability, nervousness, depression, insomnia, loss of appetite. Right, calcium is another one. Calcium is really essential for uh, smoothing out muscle contractions, helping nerve transmission, regulating cell division, and uh, a deficiency can cause agitation, depression, heart palpitations, etc., etc. There's a guy called Hibbelm, right, and he developed something called his dietary intervention. They use this in prisons. Uh, it reduces the consumption of omega-3 fatty acids, omega-6 fatty acids, and increasing the levels of omega-3, DHA, and EPA, zinc, vitamin B. These all have a generated a positive outcome in people with anxiety symptoms. Deficiency in vitamin B uh, in vitamin C reduces the production of neurotransmitters associated with anxiety. Now, neurotransmitters are chemicals in your brain that communicate between the nerve cells and affect our mood and sleep. Now, tryptophan. Tryptophan is an essential amino acid that our body can't make. It's converted into 5-HTP which in turn turns into serotonin. Right? There's a lot of evidence that uh, a, re a reduction in tryptophan causes a reduction in the synthesizing of serotonin which results in mood disorders. It's important to know if you're taking anti-anxiety drugs you shouldn't take tryptophan or 5-HTP without the supervision of a care professional because it can give rise to an effective overdose of that drug. Now, there are also some herbs such as passion flower. Now it's got a very strong sedative and hypnotic uh, property. It's particularly effective when used in combination with other herbs such as valerian or chamomile. <laughs> Connectedness. A large part of our sense of self is driven by group membership and social identity. If someone can make a drug that provided the same level of improvement a social group therapy, they'd, they'd make millions. Exercise, what can I say? <laughs> it makes us feel less tired, it improves our ability to think clearly, distracts us from unhelpful thoughts, it uses up adrenaline, gives us a sense of achievement, stimulates the body to reduce its natural antidepressants, makes us feel more healthy and stimulates our appetite. It's a good idea in your daily plan to write down all the events of the day and put a B beside those that, that are bodily sensations, give you some sensual pleasure, an A next to the activities where you feel some sort of achievement, and don't forget the L, A, N, C, E, and D. Thank you for listening. If anyone's got any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. What a what a beautiful presentation this was. I, I have to say that uh, it was one of the best that you've done so far. And uh, <laughs> just before, uh, I have to say this really because especially the part when you were describing the breathing technique, uh, because uh, now it's been some like six, six eight or ten years. Uh, but I learned about uh, from an institute of mind sciences. Uh, there's a psychiatrist, therapist, doctor back in my home country. Uh, and uh, 
it actually worked. Uh, in fact, it, uh, what we were taught was that it takes you to a higher relaxing, takes you to, to a higher mental state also. Mm -hmm. and, uh, many more faculties of your own mind in that higher mental state. Uh, so what a beautiful presentation it was. And just a correction, um, you said uh, that uh, we had spoken about, uh, when you were talking about the nutritional aspects and water, uh, being in diet, uh, drinking a lot of water, uh, that was in uh, that wasn't in the Quran. It was in the uh, sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. Ah, right. In the hadith. <laughs> they were in the hadith. Yeah, it's, that's an important correction. It's uh, no less true, yeah. though. True. In fact, uh, uh, there are a lot more things that came to my mind on the way, uh, but well, that's a topic for another day. So, <clears throat> yeah, we started having some questions. And, uh, uh, Salomon, do you uh, have any questions while I uh, get these together? That yeah. Are, uh, uh, put up? Well, also I want to say thank you because uh, this was a pretty good summary of a, a lot of things uh, we were in, uh, meaning to share with people. And, and you really put it all together in, in one thing. And, and the beautiful thing also is that you are uh, uh, putting together so many approaches. And it's not only uh, the CBT and not only the nutrition. It's uh, about uh, everything, and and you know, an anxiety is something that builds up uh, with the little things that happen to you in life. So it's it makes sense to me a lot that uh, you had to do many little things to to make it better. Now I wanted to to ask you a mm -hmm. question: uh, What what are your stance regarding medication? Uh, do you believe medication is a good treatment? Uh, do you recommend it? Right now, medication is. It's quite controversial. Um, there's a, a Dr. Irving, uh, for example, who has said that SSRIs are no more effective than a placebo. But then Dr. Irving makes his living by um, having these huge exposés. <laughs> so uh, my personal stance is that if someone has very severe symptoms, then medication can give a very quick way of bringing that person's anxiety levels down so that they can do the critical thinking. Medication on its own actually isn't very effective. It stops working after about four weeks and starts to have a perverse effect, making you more anxious. Uh, that's particularly the benzodiazepines I'm talking about there. But um, if your anxiety levels are really running very high and there's some standardized tests that we can do to help you judge where that is, then perhaps you might consider um, medication. You can by using the your release of endorphins and um, the serotonin and practicing the muscle relaxation get there, but that takes longer. Natural methods do take longer. If you need something to bring you down quickly, medication will do that. But you've got to back it up with the critical thinking, otherwise you're going to end up back where you started when you come off the meds. So do, do you prescribe medication to your patients or this is an, something unusual? I don't prescribe medication for my patients. Uh, anyone who comes to, to see me, but generally any therapist will tell you the same. If someone's coming with anxiety symptoms or depression symptoms, we first ask them to go and see their doctor because those symptoms can be coming from a physical illness and all the talking therapy in the world and all the breathing and all the, <laughs> all the muscle relaxation isn't actually going to deal with the, the, the root cause of the physical illness. So just to eliminate, just to be um, systematic, we ask them to have a checkup with the doctor to ensure that there is nothing underlying that's giving rise to these symptoms. Then if it is psychological, we can then do the therapy. I also tell people about other other approaches such as cognitive hypnotherapy or um, ACT or you know mindfulness based therapy. All of these all of these processes were. And I guess I'm going to shoot myself in the foot here, but being completely honest, it's not so much the approach that matters; it's the relationship between the therapist and the client. You need that trust and. If that if that builds up, it doesn't really matter the approach you take. They uh, all, yeah. 
This Sorry. brings me to another question, which is something very interesting. I've been talking with other therapists uh, lately because we are uh, contacting many people. And one of the therapists told me that uh, he believes that uh, making friends with the, with the patient is a bad idea. You know, like, uh, uh, I don't know if they, they prefer to keep the relationship, some of them at least, prefer the, to keep the relationships very cool. So, so they can be neutral about it and, and you know, and analyze you. Or, uh, but it seems that this is not the approach you are taking, right? Uh, well, when I say the relationship, it is a therapeutic, professional relationship. It's not you're not going to jump into bed with your clients, for example. You know, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, uh, there is this thing about being able to empathise with someone. Being able to empathise with someone is being able to pick up on their feelings without being overwhelmed by them yourself. If you're very close to someone, then you catch their feelings, and in the session, someone's paying you to be, you know, be systematic, be problem solving, present the options. If you're actually overwhelmed by their emotions yourself, you're not in a good place to help them. So the relationship's important. It has to be a trusting one. It has to be an open one. It has to be one where you're um, stepping, you know, taking off the mask of the therapist always being right. You're just two people helping each other. But at the same time, you're not their brother, you're not their best friend, you're not their mother, and you're certainly not their lover. <laughs> yeah, sometimes uh, people forget that the therapist is a human being. You know, many people are surprised yeah. when when they realize that their therapist has a therapist, or or this kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, <clears throat> just wanted to add here that um, uh, that it's uh, you know the the point about relationships or uh, being friendly uh, uh, with a therapist, uh, a therapist being friendly to their patients is not about uh, you know going overboard or something. I think it's part of the relation and, and for patients, especially on our social network, the kind of discussions that we see, a lot of people face the problem of going through to a therapist whom uh, you know, having bad experiences with a therapist. They go to a therapist but uh, for example the therapist wouldn't like to uh, touch them or wouldn't like to uh, or stay aloof, you know, uh, they have certain issues around them and uh, this puts them off and uh, they need a lot of care and attention, especially uh, people uh, having phobias, uh, severe sorts of them, agoraphobia, uh, people polar disorder and all, these people need a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a very relevant question with this point, uh, does CBT work for obsessive compulsive disorder and uh, would CBT alone be sufficient for it? Um, it does work for OCD. Um, now back to back to therapy systems in general. Uh, I, you know the m most famous study has shown that actually all therapies, when the clients in treatment, are all about the same level of effectiveness. It's about seventy-five to eighty percent. Okay. Now, when someone leaves therapy, if you go and look at that client group say two years down the line a lot of them will have relapsed they've gone back to the way they were because they've stopped doing what they learned to do <laughs> so um, CBT is sufficient but CBT includes being part of an extended network having having uh, a good support network around you so if you include Having having something like anxiety social net or some other fora or being having a face to face group that you can drop in and out of it and, and share ideas with people this is what humans do after all then yes it is sufficient but if you think you can just come to twelve sessions and never look at it again in your life I th think you've got some questions to ask yourself there about how the world works. True, do that. Okay, I have one question for me actually. You would be surprised, Hello. especially you. So somebody asked me, Muhammad, which country are you from? <laughs> okay, so I'm from Pakistan. <laughs> I'm from Pakistan, currently in Dubai, in the UAE. And hope to see more questions. Okay, uh, I think um, we are having quite a few questions, but I would just like to repeat once. Uh, if you have, uh, if you want to post questions, you don't know how to, uh, just post your questions as comments to this video that you are watching. Or you mm -hmm. can go to facebook.com slash anxiety. 
that is our Facebook page and you see the post for this video on top I have pinned it to the top and you can post comments there also so um, do you have uh, one I have quite a few I just wanted to ask you first I have a, a question should I go ahead with some others that you have uh, go ahead and check in actually if, if I see uh, questions okay. in uh, in the other pages at the moment okay okay uh, so somebody is asking uh, which should I use first, drugs or CBT? I think we answered it already, but just uh, if you can recap on it quickly. Okay, well, CBT is an empirical method. It doesn't rule anything in or out. It, it, it work. You use what works, right? It's something that the therapist and the client put together as a plan. The therapist obviously has a lot more information usually because they've done a lot of training and they've they've got databases and things they can look up so we present the, the information the options we, 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 we look at it in detail looking weighing up the pros and cons and then together we make a plan that plan if if someone thinks that medication is going to help them after discussing it and looking at all the pros and cons of it then we work with that we give it a try and they report back how it works it's not my job to push techniques or tools down someone's throat. I'm not trying to turn them into a clone of myself. Okay, I can I can tell you that you know ninety percent of people find that tool very useful, but you might be part of the ten percent that it doesn't work for. This is very good, I think, uh, and in also we see around the, a trend very clear uh, of of uh, some uh, physicians uh, pushing uh, certain treatments and especially medication, mm -hmm. uh, and and we see a, gr a growth every year in people taking medication. Which, uh, as as I told before, I'm not against medication, but uh, but I don't think it is uh, fit for everybody, and and it's not a final solution or or the best solution. Uh, so it's very good to see that, that uh, there are some people like you that uh, are more open and, and ready, you know, to discuss uh, stuff with the patient. And uh, because some people can be very pushy, I've been myself in uh, in, in a psychiatrist, and, and he was really pushy about it. You know, he was like, "Okay, you have to take medication, and if you don't take medication, you're going to be in trouble in a few in a few weeks." You know, <laughs> and this kind of stuff. Well, none of that. That's not actually true uh, I mean even uh, there's this study I was looking at in uh, Western Lapland where people even with very strong psychotic symptoms are not taking medication they're getting talking therapy and the the incidence of um, you know in this case it was schizophrenia dropped right down and the recovery rate of people who had already been diagnosed went through the roof it takes longer, it's more labor intensive and it takes being part of a community, it takes you know being a human being and, and talking with other people but um, it works. If there is some pressing issue that you need to deal with quickly, if there's, if there's some medical issue that you need to resolve and you won't go into hospital because you've got a fear of hospitals, then yeah, medication will get you there because if you don't go, you're going to die, right? <laughs> but um, it's horses for courses. It, it's, it's always your life. No one can live it for you. We can present you with the options and help you make an informed choice. Cool. Okay, uh, we have another question. Uh, is the CBT treatment stressful for the patient? Is it a stressful experience? Uh, actually, I think otherwise, uh, after going through the presentation and all with you. Uh, <laughs> um, hopefully not. Done badly, it can be. Um, there, is something, there is something that we use for OCD and certain other phobias called gradated exposure, where you, you kind of have this ladder of, of anxiety triggers and after a bit of preparation and learning the, the relaxation techniques, you mentally rehearse being exposed to those triggers. Okay. Um, if, that's, if that's done clumsily or pushed too fast, that can be quite distressing. Um, but 
you know, the, the, the method that, that we're meant to use is you, you go into a state of relaxation before it, you go into the visual rehearsal of the lowest trigger, the most easy, easiest one to overcome, you, sh you, you go through living through that and, and working at it well, and then you go through another relaxation technique, and then you have a review with the therapist. And over time, as your anxiety level drops down, you take away the first part of the, the process. and You don't do it without relaxing beforehand. You just go straight into the rehearsal. You have the relaxation afterwards, and then you have the review. Okay. When you bring that down, then you do the rehearsal, leave off the relaxation, and have the review. And then you would try the real thing with a bit of support. And then you try the real thing without the support. That's the gradated, classic behaviorist gradated exposure method. If you've got an inexperienced therapist or someone who's in a hurry, that can be distressing. Mm -hmm. But it, it, done properly, it shouldn't be. And uh, I wanted to hear a little more about, uh, you talk about a few herbs and and uh, that can help people deal with an anxiety. That, that was uh, pretty interesting because I never mm -hmm. heard of, of those. And can you talk a little more about them and, and how, how, how do they work, uh, where you can get them, and if you need the, uh, to, to consult a doctor before taking them? Well, some herbs you should... Uh, yeah? Uh, to, uh, Kevin, just before you continue to answer this, uh, I'd just like to add another question to it. Uh, uh, it's part of a question from one of our, uh, one of our viewers also. Uh, if you would remember, we also had a chat when we were talking previously. Uh, about uh, a lot of things that our parents have been telling us uh, about drinking hot milk, warm milk before you go to sleep. Yeah. Uh, so you know, uh, so if you could cover the nutritional aspects, you know, things like that, plus Salomon's question, and put them together so that people have a good idea of what we are talking about. Uh, okay. In, uh, in the case of nutrition. Okay. These are the, these are related, but actually quite separate. Mm. Um. Mm. A lot of the self-care stuff that, that I, I talked about is the stuff that our parents have been telling us. And maybe when we were young, it's like, yeah, 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 I don't really pay much attention to it. But this stuff works. That's why they're telling us. <laughs> it's coming from experience. Um, that, the, the hot milk, for example, milk is a source of tryptophan, right? Tryptophan, as I said, it helps build the 5-HTP, which becomes serotonin. It also contains fat, and the, the fat stimulates the rest and digest response. I don't know if you've ever had a big meal and then felt sleepy afterwards. Certainly here in England, we have you know the Christmas Day meal, and by the time the Queen's on, we're all half asleep, you know. <laughs> and it, it's the fat content of what of what we've just taken in. It it makes us drowsy. A lot of people who do um, staff trainings don't don't have uh, high fat foods in the in the lunch because by the afternoon session the, the participants are all half asleep so it, it that fat thing is just you know it, it's um just one of these things about science now um, herbs herbal medicine is medicine okay when I was talking about valerian root that's where we got that's where we get Valium from. The, the, the benzodiazepine is a synthesized form. A lot of the medicines that we use today come from plants. Okay. And they've been, what's happened is big pharma, the, the pharmaceutical industry has taken the active ingredients from them and put them into little pills and potions. So that, you know, they, they, they're faster acting, they get into the bloodstream faster, they hit you harder. But the same things are in plants, but in a sort of down, down-tuned or detoned version. Um, for example, coca and cocaine. Right? Mm. The the South Americans chew coca. For them, it's a mild stimulant. You extract the active ingredient. You synthesize that. You turn it into cocaine. You have a very powerful drug that will kill you. <laughs> um, separating so. Where do you find these things? Well, you find them growing in your garden, um, <laughs> if you grow them. You can find them in herbal shops, but everything you put in your body affects 
both your, your affects you physically, but it can affect your mind. Everything, sugar, water, everything, right? If you're going to take, if you're going to take something with the, with the purpose of altering your mood or managing your mood, definitely get some advice first. You know, um, that's only sensible. I mean, doesn't have to be a doctor. You could ask. You could ask someone at the local herbalist shop. You can ask. You can go onto Anxiety Social Net and see if anyone else has been doing it and whether they found it useful. You know, the same as anything. If you're going to buy a car, you don't just go out and pick the first car you come to, is it? You you check things out. It's exactly the same, except it's more important because this is affecting your health. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so uh, I just got a comment that uh, my voice is coming down a little lower. Can you guys hear me uh, properly? I hear you. Okay. I hear you, yes. So it's, uh, there, there seems to be some problem in the life. Okay, anyways, uh, so can you, uh, Kevin, next question is, uh, so can you tell us about some tricks and techniques to take away anxiety for a little while? Yeah. Only, if only for a little while? Oh, God, uh, all of them. Right. You know what I was talking about, the behavioral strategies? And I was talking about how they're specific, most of them are specifically designed to release endorphins and deal with the adrenaline, right? Or release serotonin and deal with the cortisol. Now, all of these, all of these behavioral strategies, they're fast acting, but relatively short acting. And you've got to change them up. Remember, I talked a bit about how the receptor sites get, um, develop a tolerance and you get a lot of diminishing returns. So you have a spread of these. But, the diaphragmatic breathing, um, the muscle relaxation, um, anything, bring good things into your life, get your serotonin levels up, develop that resilience. Um, those breathing exercises I, I was talking about in the presentation are the kind of lower level basic ones. There are, there are far more advanced breathing techniques that you would use in, in yoga, for example. Now, these do work. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with them, but you should really do it under some supervision. Just going off because you can make yourself lightheaded, you can make yourself dizzy, you can you know, you can hurt yourself basically. Mm. So um, we started with those ones. Those ones are safe. You don't really need any special practice or anything to try those. Mm. As you go on, you can try some of the ones that will flex your diaphragm a bit more. And obviously, the more you're flexing your diaphragm, the more endorphins are getting released. And remember, that neutralizes the adrenaline, brings it down, allows you to think. All of those techniques will work in the short term. I want to ask a question. Uh, I, I, I mean once in a, in a sort of a seminar, and I, and I saw people were doing this, uh, this breathing technique, which was... Uh, Something uh, pretty interesting. They, I don't know, maybe it's that what you're talking about or, or not, but uh, I want to hear what you think about it. This, the, the, this was uh, some sort of hyperventilation exercise when people were like uh, getting in some sort of altered uh, state of awareness by, by just uh, breathing and fast, you know, like uh, and all the time. Are you yes. familiar with this? What do you think about this? Well, Endorphins are the, as I said, the body's natural painkillers, right? Um, we like heroin so much because the heroin molecule looks a lot like the endorphin molecule and it fits the same chemical lock, right? If you stimulate, if you get, if you do a lot of exercise and you, or you do the breathing exercises, you're going to feel euphoric. You're going to feel a nice warm sense of well-being. That is the endorphins. Um, some people see that as some kind of spiritual like, experience. Um, for me, it's purely chemical, right? Uh, singing does it. If you're singing a lot, you're breathing out a lot, you're flexing your diaphragm a lot. <laughs> Laughter yoga that I was talking about is exactly the same thing. Uh, sitting going, um, well, you're breathing out, right? <laughs> um, these things all do work. You can make cults of them, and people can make it their special shtick and, and, and sort of become a little guru. And well, if that's what they're into, that's that's them. Um, knowing how they work and being able to use it yourself, right, and becoming your own therapist and being able to 
pick and choose the techniques that work best for you and, and, and tap them into your life. That is what CBT is about. It's not about setting up a little cult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, yes, the, 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 some of the breathing techniques are, I, I guess, maybe one of the ones you were looking for was um, what they call fire breath, where they breathe rapidly down through their nose a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? That, that is actually a pranayama technique. And when you do it, you really do feel the diaphragm move. Yeah? You do that for a while. You will feel lightheaded, but you'll also get that release of endorphins and you'll get a sense of well-being. And it is the chemicals that are doing it. It's not, it's not the spirits. Yeah, yeah, no, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm, sure I'm sure many people will, like, will, will uh, not agree with, with this idea. But, uh, but you know, we're in, a, we're in a stage of science that we already know all this stuff and, and it's clear that uh, it, it doesn't really matter, I think, also, because at the no. end of the day, what, what, what is important is, uh, is, is if this helps or not. Yes, that's it, uh, exactly. I uh, just have a, just a question that I've been, actually, I had this question for, from quite a long time ago, years ago, but just popped to my mind. Uh, I want to know, uh, when you are doing a breathing technique, uh, this, this is something that, you know, the, again, that I learned at the Institute of Mind, but I forgot. So I just want to know: uh, Do you breathe uh, like they were? They were teaching something like you breathe in with your mouth and breathe out with your nostril. Is that the way to do it, or the that other that is the that is the the classic technique. Um, it doesn't really matter so long as you're flexing your diaphragm. Uh, when you're breathing out through your nostrils, you you are pushing up harder. You're making your diaphragm work harder. But ultimately, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have a very important question, and mm. um, uh, you know, it, the two questions are related. Actually, they are about addiction. So uh, I'll put the two together. Uh, does mm. uh, does CBD help, or uh, other forms of therapy help with addictions? And the other question put together is: uh, I'm having severe uh, problems with my opiate uh, withdrawals. Can see can can you tell me something that would help me alleviate the situation? Right. Now opiate withdrawals are a very difficult one because what's happened is that the body has um, been fooled into thinking that endorphins have been released, and it turns up the volume. It, it, it compensates for that. By, sensitiz by sensitizing the nervous system, everything's working a bit faster. So as the, as the opiate wears off, you experience pain, cramps. It, it, is, actually, it is actually incredibly painful. Um, so yes, breathing, muscle relaxation, any of those things will help. All the self-care stuff, you know, using the fatty foods, you know, Having you know, having nice, comfortable surroundings, talking it through, taking your mind off these things, they will get you so far. Some people want to use a an, a, 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 a substitute. Now there are quite a few substitutes. Um, the most common one, and that's only common because it's cheap, is methadone. Another one would be Subutex, right? That now, uh, now the difference between the two is um, Subutex actually blocks the receptors and if you were then to take an opiate you would automatically go into withdrawal so it has a carrot and stick approach it is easier to come off when you take methadone it's very it's it is in itself an opiate it's just it's just um, a very weak one um, it takes a long time to come off methadone and there are horrible side effects with it, especially, particularly if you drink. Um, it potentiates the alcohol and you can feel quite funny inside. In fact, some people do that because that's how they want to feel. But um, interestingly, 70% of soldiers returning from the Vietnam War who were strung out in opiates managed to stop without any help at all. It was only 30% of, of the people who came back that needed a bit of extra help. And of those, it was only 20% who actually needed 
chemical help. Oh, really? That's, yeah. that's really interesting because, uh, because that, that was quite, it, it took some epidemic proportions, uh, that mm. particular case. And mm. it's very interesting for me to learn that 70% uh, of them were, did not require any, uh, um, you know, so, so is it, uh, you know, it sounds like uh, they were able to find some good solution out of it because uh, we all know for, for a fact that it's, it's, it's quite hell. Mm. Now, you, you also said, does CBT help with um, addictions and dependency? Uh, yes, in yeah. fact, um, most, of the, most of the organizations uh, working uh, in, in Britain that are taking uh, money from the government are using different versions of CBT in their approach. Certainly the one I work for on my day job, that's what we do. Um, in fact, there is in America the the whole smart recovery movement, which is based on REBT, which was uh, a form of CBT invented by a guy called Albert Ellis, and that relies that is purely CBT, and it's but it's peer groups and people sharing ideas and what works for them and supporting each other. It is a it is a group format. Uh, so, in short, yes. There is a very long answer, but um, maybe we could talk afterwards. <laughs> Kevin, yeah, uh, are you familiar with uh, with uh, with a um, plant? It's called uh, ibogaine. You heard yes, about that? Yes, I have heard of ibogaine. Yes. What can um, what can say about this? It is very effective. Um, one of the one of the problems with ibogaine is that it can you can have some bizarre experiences when you take it, and if you Unless you're around people that can help you and support you in that and contextualize what you're experiencing, mm. that can give rise to psychosis because your, your mind then starts to create reasons why you're experiencing these things and you, you, you would then bring these kind of delusional mindsets into your, your pattern of thinking. So... Ibogaine does give good results in the right setting and in the right context. Are, in are, Britain, are you guys using it in, in? Are you using it in in Britain? No, um, it's not. It's not uh, recommended for use by the National Institute of Health and Cl Clinical Excellence because it requires quite a skilled practitioner to support someone while they're using it. Um, a lot of uh, Th this came a lot from shamanic practice and a, a lot of people with, the, with addictions were going over and they were in situ in the, in the tribe and, and working with the shamans and if you have that kind of leaning, if you have that kind of mindset then that will work mm -hmm. but that's not everyone. Um, the same way that the 12 step tr tradition which is very high in the whole spirituality um, concepts will work for some people and not for others. There are other people who book themselves into a, a, you know, a Buddhist monastery in Thailand and sit there. There are some people who go to Pakistan and, 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 and go, to one of, go to one of those schools and that's how they come off. That's had some unfortunate effects because those schools are not always just about helping people but then that's the same wherever you go. Pros and cons, you know, like yeah. every treatment. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask uh, this drug that you guys were talking about, ibogaine. Is it uh, uh, the context is uh, fighting uh, fighting opiate withdrawal? Is that the context? Yes, it's for uh, uh, heroin addicts. And uh, I, I I actually saw a documentary movie a few months mm. ago, and uh, and this guy was actually also illegally giving these treatments to people because he also came off uh, heroin addiction with this. Mm -hmm. and, and and he was uh, traveling all 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 around USA and giving this treatment and it seems that that what he claimed is that the uh, ibogaine uh, uh, help people uh, kick off the addiction without the, the withdrawal symptoms that okay. it does something in the brain that is not quite clear what it is well i'd say that physically the the withdrawals are taking place it's just that you're not aware of it. <laughs> <laughs> mind body, you know, mind over body. Yes. <laughs> okay, Kevin. Uh, I uh, 
I have another question, uh, but yeah. before that, I have a personal question. I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, I've also heard this from my parents and read this in, uh, you know, hadith and scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're angry, if you're depressed, if, if you're feeling uh, a burst of anger, you know, like, uh, which is like a shot of adrenaline in your mm -hmm. body, uh, does drinking water, uh, sitting down and drinking water help? Does lying down? Uh, uh, do these two things uh, can they alleviate the situation of you know they can anger? yeah um anger is an anxiety response okay uh, certainly from certainly from a cbt perspective anger isn't an emotion it's an anxiety response it's it's attempting to take control of okay. of what's going on uh, which you can see is something that people who are anxious try to do um, now, the same chemicals, the cortisol and the adrenaline, are being released. What's happening is that we've contextualized what's happened differently. Now, I'm going to step, step to one side a little bit. The same happens whether you're horny, angry, excited, scared. It's the same chemicals. What's happening is that our brain's what interpreting things. the situation differently, which is why you can flip from one arousal state to the other very quickly. So you, know, you can become frustrated, you can become angry. It's very quick. Very now, um, back to the water. Now, uh, if you've ever noticed animals, when they're anxious, they drink to soothe themselves. You, you'll see it in the wild. You'll see it at home if you've got a cat or a dog. When they're anxious, they drink, right? That that physical, the physical thing of just taking in water and swallowing it, actually helps calm us. Now, if you were to make that fizzy water, from the slides you can see, right? You've got the carbon carbon dioxide that you know, extends the blood vessels and you know reduces the smooth muscle contractions and all the rest of it. Um, then you've got then you've got something else going as well. It Absolutely. enhances. Now, the the lying down, that can go one of two ways. If you lie down and your mind's churning over what made you angry, you're not going to calm down. Right? Okay. If you lie down and you relax yourself and and you you distract yourself with with pleasant thoughts, or then yes, that that would work. Okay. Right. I'm afraid that, that there's no one simple answer for for these things. Yeah, no, no. I just uh, this was just for, you know uh, just a question that came to my mm. mind because uh, I've been uh, listening to this a lot. It's like uh, if if you're uh, when you're angry, if you're standing, sit down. If mm. you are uh, sitting down, lie down and drink mm. water. Drink water and then yes. do this, and you'll uh, soothe down. So that that yes. was a trick that I've been taught uh, about uh, you know for getting down from an angry situation. Yeah. Are you st question? Sorry, sorry. Please go ahead. I used to work with um, male perpetrators of violence and um, we used to teach them um, one of the first things to do is sit in your hands. Because <laughs> if you sit in your hands you can't hit someone. <laughs> um, and, and, and the 10 foot rule, stay 10 foot away from the person you're angry from because you're not okay. going to be able. But those things aside, um, yeah, if you're standing, sit, if you're sitting, lie. Um, if nothing else, it means the person you're angry with can get out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, now this is a very important one. The next question: Hyp hypnotherapy mm -hmm. and and cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference and uh, in your opinion is uh, better. Okay. Hypnotherapy. Does all that, remember, remember in the slides I was talking about using these techniques to buy you the headspace so you can do the critical thinking. Now, hypnotherapy can, br can bring you down, bring you into a deep state of relaxation so that then you can do the thinking around what's driving your anxiety, right? And it works, and it works really well. And, you know, I'm sorry to say, but it works even faster than CBT. <laughs> I'm going to lose some customers here, right? But um, the the downside of it is, is that you're not learning those techniques. 
right? Someone's doing it to you. They're relaxing. They're helping you come down really fast, so that the next time something that would be very good for that one situation that's making you anxious, but then the next thing that comes along that, that, that gives you an anxiety response, you're going to have to go back to the therapist. You haven't learned those techniques and become your own therapist and developed your own strategies. So it depends what it is that you're after. If you're looking for a quick fix because you need to do this one thing, like give the killer presentation or, I don't know, set that, set that law exam or whatever, then yeah, fine. If you're looking at something that's going to bring more balance into your life and generally help you cope, then you might want to try CBT instead. Okay. It sounds like uh, like it can be also very very good to to do an integrated approach using both. Well, that is cognitive hypnotherapy. Oh, and uh, <laughs> and um, that 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 is pretty much what they do. They bring you into the deep state of relaxation, and then they do the cognitive stuff with you. Again, it's very good on that one particular issue, but it won't work on other things that you might have an anxiety response to because the relaxation came through hypnotherapy rather than through learning techniques and learning to, to balance your life. Okay, uh, uh, remember Saru, we were talking about this in the first session with you and I, it just came to my mind and I'll put the question uh, on the board mm -hmm. and let's see where we can go ahead with this. Um, and let's try to you know quickly do this because uh, we've crossed an hour 15 minutes. Um, now hypnotherapy. If we were to, uh, there are. If we were, you know, like for every, there are few basic human beings which lead us to all the rest of the situation. Uh, maybe I'm wrong and maybe I'm right. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, what we were discussing is we can use hypnosis or hypnotherapy to actually change uh, the way we think about certain very important things. And uh, the building that stands on foundation will automatically correct itself. So we work on the grassroots level with hypnotherapy, and maybe it would be, you know, uh, uh, highly beneficial. And we might not have to go over and over again to, you know, to a hypnotherapist to get cures for one thing, then another, then a third. Uh, so yeah, that's. Uh, well, that 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 is that is true. Um, there is something called the Hamilton susceptibility scale. Um, okay. People become more susceptible to suggestion when they're very relaxed or when they're very tense, right? Very stressed. This is how interrogations work. Okay. <laughs> um, now, by bringing someone down into a deep state of relaxation, you can get in at those messages that are driving our anxiety. The the musts, the, the the shoulds, the the labeling, all of that stuff that we you know we talked about the negative automatic thoughts, and then you know further up the tree into the the, the core beliefs, and you know, the filter through which you perceive things, right? That is that is true for for a lot of um, stressors that come along that would active would normally activate our um, anxiety response. Obviously, if you're interpreting them differently, you're not going to be hit the same way. The trouble is that we live in almost an inf well, we live in a quantum universe. There are so many different things that can stress us that you can't possibly just fix it with um, changing your thought. It's a combined approach. Sometimes we need we need to feel anxious. We need to feel stressed. It's part of our body's survival mechanism. It's what gears us up to act and, and, and um, survive in emergency situations. You don't want to take it away. You, you wouldn't be able to function. You know, you get knocked down the next time a car's coming too quickly around the corner. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, the thing is, not to be overwhelmed by that, not to be paralyzed by it, not to have it hit you so hard that you can no longer function. Yeah. So although, yes, you can reinterpret, you've also got to learn how to manage these emotions and how to manage your life so that you're not setting yourself up to, to be you know, 
knocked aside. The Buddhists call this coursing the four worldly winds. And a lot of Buddhist practice, the meditation practice, the mindfulness practice that they use, we use in CBT as well. In fact, we steal from everyone. We, you know, if it works, we take it. <laughs> great, this is great. Okay, so uh, now uh, I think uh, we are having, uh, you know, questions are flowing in. We can't uh, go on for much longer and uh, we really need to uh, really appreciate if Kevin, you can talk about your private practice and uh, and exactly, you know, where you're located and all. Uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of people from the UK, so, and, uh, you know, tell us about your own personal thing. Uh, well, I have a private practice in Hackney. I... I work during the day in a, a drug project actually, working with people who um, get into trouble with the law and uh, who have an addiction problem. So my private practice is evenings and weekends. Okay. And um, what I do is I give everyone a free assessment and talk to them about all the different options, the hypnotherapy, the getting on the NHS, all of these, and then they can choose which one of those is best for them. I still feel a bit um, awkward about charging. <laughs> um, you know, uh, in Britain we have social medicine, so uh, you know, I like to give people all the options. Now, it's in Hackney. Um, I have a website uh, which uh, will be on the the, Description. the network. Description yes. Of this video also, yeah. yeah. And um, I have a uh, I have a phone number. I'm easily found. If you just Google Hackney CBT, I come up. Right? It's you you know, find it there. yeah. Okay. I'm okay, not. Uh, I would like to talk about. I, I have. I'm developing a a group um, which is similar to co counselling. I don't know how much you you guys know about the old co counselling of the 1970s and 1980s. It was using uh, psychodynamic techniques. Well, this is a peer support group using CBT rather than um, um, psychoanalysis. And uh, like all good peer support groups, it's free. Uh, you don't charge people for helping themselves. You know that that's just <laughs> that's just a step too far. <laughs> that's amazing. That's, that's, because, uh, <laughs> that's just because you're a nice person. Because uh, because in our opinion, over time. We have seen that uh, it's not only uh, that pe people uh, just to uh, uh, just to allow people to help help themselves, uh, but they charge even they are, if they are not professional enough, you know, which is even uh, yes. And we're seeing that a lot also, you know, in this industry, and we are trying to uncover as much as possible of that because uh, they are they're charging people for self help books, which is exactly what you're saying, you know. They just put together some stuff and they don't even have, a, a, you know, professional studies or not do doctors or nothing, mm. and they're charging and, you know, scamming people. So, so also, we, we will love to open a group in, in an exciting social net. So you can be in contact with the people once once you have the people and you know send messages and and maybe can, people can join mm -hmm. and uh, of course you you also can do Google Hangouts. Many people are doing Google Hangouts for this for for group therapy. Yeah, you guys taught me this. <laughs> I was using <laughs> Skype before. <laughs> yeah, you can bring you can bring an, up to ten people I think here at the same mm -hmm. time. Uh, you know what I I discovered yesterday morning that there are some public hang which can host up to 50 people also so let's uh, we are we are also in the learning process so we'll tell you about <laughs> it uh, as soon as we find out more yeah <laughs> and uh, you know it's it's increasing the power of the web is increasing by the day so there'll be much more coming up and uh, i think uh, that's it from our side today guys uh, i would just like to repeat once that uh, it's very important to find uh, it would be the worst thing that you could do to yourself if you did not go ahead to try to treat your anxieties. Mm. And uh, the first step would be to get information. And this is not a marketing message, but we, you know we are for real. So if, if you uh, want kind of information, uh, you can go to Anxiety Social Net. You'll find Kevin's uh, Kevin there also. You can you know look for his name, uh, and you can post up any question you can come to the Facebook page we try to be very active uh, we are mm -hmm. here uh, 
uh, you know, with a with a passion to try to help people. There are only in the U.S. alone there are 20 million uh, registered uh, anxiety patients. Um, uh, we were talking about it yesterday. If we counted, uh, it says the U.S. says that there are social anxiety patients is the number third most uh, is the third most number of affected people by any disease in the U.S. So first mm-hmm. being addictions or alcohol, I think. Mm-hmm. But uh, in our opinion, if we counted uh, all the people in the world together with mental health issues, I think you know they would cross a billion or something. So, uh, so the, the, you know, it's a long and a hard way, but you have first step, and uh, and uh, we do think that therapy, uh, therapy is a very very good option, and uh, so yeah, we hope to see you again. Uh, we'll be continuing this series over the week till Monday. We have another therapist coming tomorrow. Uh, we have a life coach coming the day after. We we have a blogger who is a pool fighter. Uh, the day after, and then at the end, we'll be co- we'll be some Salo and I will be summing everything up together in one uh, one hour session. So, with that, uh, Salomon, do you have anything to say? No, just want to say thank you, Kevin. Uh, it was great, and I for sure learned a lot of stuff today. And uh, I hope everybody liked it also. Thanks a lot. Thank you very okay. much for joining us, Kevin. It was it was beautiful. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. We'll see you. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care.